Deadly crash. Now deputies say items found in the suspect's car could lead them to more legal issues. The San Antonio missions have new owners, and today we got the chance to hear from the new leadership. RJ Marquez has that story for us this noon. And it's cool today, but just wait. The weekend is going to be cold and somewhat rainy, too. We've got the latest forecast for you coming up. Live from Case at 12, the news at noon starts right now. A driver is being treated for serious injuries and possibly facing some serious charges after what Bear County's sheriff is calling a horrific crash. The car flew off an elevated section of I-35 near Freer Road and crashed on the ground below, killing a passenger. As Katrina Weber tells us, the sheriff says the driver was running from a deputy at the time. The plans were for a traffic stop, but this ending was not in the plans. A Ford Mustang was left beyond repair and a woman in the passenger seat beyond saving. Sheriff Javier Salazar says she was killed when the car flew off an elevated stretch of I-35 downtown and smashed onto the street below. The vehicle traveled, I believe they're telling us, about 110 feet after leaving that, that uh, roadway uh, and probably tumbled end over end and barrel rolled. Salazar says the 19-year-old driver was trying to get away from a deputy at the time, speeding down the Frio Street off-ramp. But that man originally drew attention around 2.30 this morning for driving too slowly. Doing about 40 miles an hour on the highway. Um, he initially uh, started, did traffic stopped that vehicle. After the driver took off, the sheriff says the deputy never officially initiated a chase. Instead, he called for help after finding what Salazar called a horrific scene. The sheriff says, curiously, this is not the first crash like this to happen in almost the exact same spot. In fact, he says when that car came off the highway, it landed on a memorial for a previous victim. In this case, the driver could be facing serious charges. We, there was a blood draw done, and we will be analyzing that blood to see if intoxicants played a role in it. He says the driver also had outstanding warrants and investigators found a gun along with what may be stolen checkbooks inside the car. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. It's now been two years since someone shot and killed a San Antonio teenager, and police are no closer to finding the person who pulled the trigger. That person ended the life of 18-year-old Jalen Alexander Richardson. Back in November of 2020, officers received an early morning call about a shooting near UTSA Boulevard and I-10. Police say someone in a dark colored SUV fired several shots at two vehicles. At least one of those bullets hit Richardson. If you know anything that can help police solve this murder, you're asked to call Crime Stoppers at 210-224-STOP. Today we heard for the first time from the new Missions Baseball ownership group that includes a lot of heavy hitters. Part of the group, along with Missions officials, spoke during a press conference this morning at Wolf Stadium, and that's where we find our R.J. Marquez with the latest. R.J.? Yeah, David and Tiffany, this is a big day, not only for the missions, but for the future of professional baseball here in San Antonio. And today, the discussion was all about local ownerships, keeping this franchise in the Alamo City for decades to come. This is the first time that local owners will now have control of this franchise since the 1980s. And a local investor group told us that they started working on this reported $28 million deal to buy the missions back in February, and the sale closed just this week. The new ownership group is, of course, called Designated bidders LLC. It includes former Rackspace CEO Graham Weston, Weston Urban officials, Spurs Sports and Entertainment Chairman Peter J. Holt, the Cortez family and other prominent people in the city of San Antonio. Ryan Sanders Baseball will operate the team and now of course there are questions about renovating Wolf Stadium or potentially building another stadium in the downtown area in the near future. Here's what Reed Ryan and Mayor Ron Nuremberg had to say about those discussions. We know that we're going to have to address the deficiencies uh, with Nelson Wolf Stadium. And I think our thought is we want to fully develop a plan that involves a community that says what is in the best interest of baseball long term in San Antonio. With respect to uh, participation, this is a city owned facility that we're in right now. Uh, any kind of investment from the public would, would have to uh, have a serious look at public benefit uh, and return on investment. And that's been a big topic of, of discussion there, public money being used to fund any sort of new stadium. 
Now, this all goes back to basically the team has been under pressure from Major League Baseball to make improvements to Wolf Stadium for years now to bring it in line with new league standards by 2025 or build a new facility. Some recent improvements here included replacing stadium field padding and changing the locker rooms, but there's a long ways to go. They have to remodel the clubhouse and dugouts, and that will be the next step. Now, Reed Ryan told us that they expect to stay here at Wolf for the next few years, and they will also stay as a double A team now for the time being and be an affiliate of the San Diego Padres. David and Tiffany, back to you guys. Thank you, RJ. An Amtrak train that left San Antonio yesterday was delayed several hours after it collided with a car in central Texas, killing one person. ABC News reports that that train, Texas Eagle Train 22, hit a car on the tracks in Moody. That's just north of Temple in McLennan County. DPS confirmed with ABC affiliate KXXV that someone died in the crash, but that person's identity was not released. According to ABC News, the train originated in Chicago and its final destination is Los Angeles. A teen nursing a gunshot wound after police say someone fired at him while he was walking near his home. According to San Antonio police early this morning, the teen was walking through a pedestrian gate at the reserves at Pecan Valley apartment complex. That's on the southeast side on East South Cross. Police say someone in a car drove by, started shooting at the teen, hitting him in the leg. He was taken to the hospital. At last check, police do not have anyone arrested. It's back to square one for a home that was under construction. It was destroyed around 10 last night after a fire. This was on Arkansas Avenue and South New Braunfels. Crews had their hands full with the flames, but they were able to get them out. While it's still not clear what sparked the fire, police tell us they found gas, rags, and matches in the area. And they say there was a woman near the scene and they're asking her questions. So far, officers are not calling her a suspect. Overnight, some small quakes felt across West Texas. This comes after a big one yesterday afternoon. That quake was felt even here in San Antonio. Experts say we could feel it here because of its size and the geology of the landscape. That quake coming in at a 5.4 magnitude, the third strongest in state history. Its epicenter was near Menton, Texas, with tremors stretching about 350 miles. Scientists say earthquakes in West Texas are becoming more common. The Uvalde CISD Police Department is seeing some change. The district has a new interim police chief. The board voted unanimously to approve Josh Gutierrez last night. He comes with a long list of credentials with law enforcement and education. He was previously at East Central and Lavernia ISD. In Lavernia, he served as director of safety and security. Community members say the change has them feeling hopeful. The background, uh, work ethic, experience, I, th I feel that he is going to be able to fulfill the duty. So it's just a matter of time before we can see the outcome. Last night, the district also approved the location and conceptual design of the new elementary school. Nancy Pelosi says she will not seek a leadership position in the new Congress. However, she says she will remain in Congress as a representative from San Francisco. This comes after the Republican Party secured the 218 seats needed to win the majority in the U.S. House of Representatives. However, as ABC's M. Wynn reports, the party could still run into some challenges. Congressional Republicans officially winning the majority in the U.S. House, ABC News projects. Eight days after the midterms, the GOP reached the 218-seat threshold to take back control, though their victory falls short of their predictions for a red wave. Republican leader Kevin McCarthy on Fox News. It is official. One-party Democrat rule in Washington is finished. We have fired Nancy Pelosi. President Joe Biden quick to reach out to McCarthy, who's poised to become the next Speaker of the House, congratulating him, saying he's willing to work with anyone who will work with him, adding the future is too promising to be trapped in political warfare. But the stage is set for two years of a divided government with Democrats holding on to the U.S. Senate and Republicans now with more power to thwart Biden's domestic agenda, already considering holding probes into his administration and family. The more you look into Hunter Biden, the more bad things pop up. Still, McCarthy will have one of the slimmest House majorities in decades. To work for the American people, we have to work as a team or we'll lose as individuals. McCarthy still needs 218 public votes on January 3rd to gain the speakership, which raises the question of how he'll win over the 31 legislators who didn't initially vote for him in the secret ballot. M. Wynn, ABC News, Washington. Still coming up. 
The Longhorns basketball team trying to pick up the athletic department in Austin. Big non-conference win last night. Larry Mears with the highlights. With manufacturing growing in San Antonio, a local college is working to prepare students to fill those jobs. We'll explain how after the break. Manufacturing programs at St. Phillips College continue to grow and giving students the opportunity to get hands on learning and training. We take you to the lab where students are learning skills that will help them in their career in manufacturing. A lot of our students in the manufacturing technologies program are going to learn a lot of the programming language for all these high tech uh, pieces of equipment. Assistant Professor Anthony Broderick at St. Phillips College says the Advanced Manufacturing and Logistics Institute is growing. We now have over 2,900 students between Martin Luther King and Southwest Campus here. The institute is designed for students who have an interest in areas such as transportation, construction, and manufacturing. Students have a great opportunity here to learn some technical skills that are industry standard. Like every employer out there, as you know, there's a growing industry presence here, and they all have a set of standards and skills that they want to learn, and they have the opportunity here at St. Phillips to learn them. Students in this lab use these machines to create everyday items, small or large like this bottle opener that could be used in our everyday lives. Uh, right now this is one of my students works It's the Texas Star. Uh, he's showing me proof that he's been able to take all these skills and imbue them into blueprint reading, into the basic math, into the basic programming uh, and give me a component that actually meets our specifications. With manufacturing growing in San Antonio, this program is not slowing down. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. Building stuff. Love that. It's amazing. And we're seeing all the companies continue to make San Antonio their home. Speaking of building, clouds are building. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's a good transition with it. <laughs> it was nice. <laughs> nice to done. And get used to these clouds because they're not going anywhere. We may see a few breaks today, but after today, a lot of cloud cover going into the weekend. And that's going to keep things pretty chilly. The aquifer hasn't changed. It's at 635.3 today in your pollen count. It's just mold. There, it's low at 330. We take a look ahead to what could be somewhat of a rainy and really cold Saturday. That forecast is straight ahead. Back over the summer, we were keeping track of all the days that were over 90 and all the days that was above average, were above average, and now we're keeping track uh, below average. What happened to <laughs> happen? There was no happy meeting. We just like skipped right through the, the, the middle. What That's, happened? But see, this is a lesson in statistics. That's how, that's how you get the average. So you have all these days up uh, here and then days out here and then it averages out right in the middle. There you go. <laughs> Justin wow. always has an explanation. I don't know about that. <laughs> I don't know about that. But you're right, David, in the sense that we've spent uh, several days now below average, and we're going to spend several more days below average going forward, probably through the middle part of next week. Uh, one thing is for certain, we don't need an average to tell us that it has been a very, very dry year. The drought monitor came out today, and really it remains unchanged. You got King and Lake Kerrville. New Braunfels down to San Antonio where we've just been hit really hard. We're still within that exceptional drought and that is as bad as it gets. We zoom in a little bit closer here. Canyon Lake, New Braunfels, Seguin, Converse, Holotus, north side of San Antonio, Bernie, Comfort. Those are areas that just have not seen any rainfall. Well, we've seen rainfall, but not near enough. Uh, even San Antonio sits within the extreme drought. Elmendorf, Divine, Hondo. You get the idea. It's, uh, it's, it's a bad situation. And as we look at Medina Lake, this isn't really changed much. Medina Lake was falling pretty consistently during the summer. We've kind of held steady now recently, which, which is good, but it's still only 6.8% full. It's down 79 feet, down 34 feet from one year ago. And we officially took back the top spot today as the driest year on record, at least year to date, 9.51. We would average about 30 inches of rain by this time of year. We haven't even got to 10 inches yet. 1917, they were above 10 inches at this point. 1956 on this date was up to 13.21. So we are close to setting some records this year. We'll see how the rest of November and December plays out. But uh, we know the rain, we need it in the worst way. We got literally a few sprinkles this morning. That was it. Uh, there was even a report of some very, very light sleep near the Lavernia area, which 
if the air is dry enough underneath that cloud layer, sometimes you can get some evaporation and it causes things to cool down. And you can actually get a little bit of sleet to reach the ground. That's what we saw, but it was very, very light. And all of this is moving out. Uh, and as we look at the rainfall potential going forward, now we're not going to get any more rain today, but as we get into tomorrow evening and Saturday, there are more chances for rain. And we could pick up maybe, maybe a quarter of an inch for lucky that the better totals are going to be off to our south and east. And even then, these aren't huge numbers. So this is not going to help us get out of our drought. But there is some potential for some rainfall especially as we head into Saturday. I think Saturday will be our most widespread rain. As we go outside for you right now, mostly cloudy. 55 degrees at the airport, 57 Stinson, 57 at Kelly, and 57 at Randolph. You see the clouds trying to break up a little bit, and I do think we'll see some peaks of sun off and on today, uh, but generally a mostly cloudy day. 58 degrees Hondo, 55 Kerrville, underneath the clouds, 50 right now in Rock Springs, and 55 with a little bit of sun in Gonzales around Bear County. Mid 50s, the norm. I think we'll get into the upper 50s for highs later today. The KSAT 12 hour forecast shows that 58 degrees at 3 o'clock, 58 at 4, and then down to 53 by 7 p.m. and 52 at 8 p.m. with plenty of clouds overnight. And certainly by tomorrow, it is going to be a cloudy day. These clouds, again, uh, hold for the most part today, and then they really start to build as we get into tomorrow. You'll notice a few light sprinkly showers. By the time we get into Friday evening, showers will become a little bit more widespread. Still very, very light. And it's on Saturday that we'll probably see our best shot at some rain showers tracking through. So it's going to be a damp Saturday, cloudy, probably a bit windy too. These showers, by the way, sort of wind down by Saturday evening. But you're looking at the weekend forecast here, and this is one of those days. 45 degrees on Saturday, 60% chance of rain, windy and cold. Cloudy with a few sprinkles on Sunday, high of only 49. So that's the weekend forecast. Next couple days, again, 50s. And then 52 Monday, we still have a pretty decent chance for some showers. And Tuesday and Wednesday, lower rain chances. We'll have to see how that forecast evolves. Still looking at the Thanksgiving and trying to iron things out. But we do know it'll be a little bit warmer, we think, on Thanksgiving, guys. So if you have plans this weekend, maybe consider taking the plans indoors instead of outside. I mean, it depends on how much you like the <laughs> cold, damp weather. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, thanks, Justin. Yep. That's what I'm talking about, though. We just, like, pass right through the 70s and the 60s. We went right down to the 50s and the 40s. Right. There's, the like, there's no middle area. Is that what you're saying? That's what I'm saying. Right. It's like nothing in the middle. <laughs> Spurs could well, – well, never mind. I was trying to think of a good transition <laughs> from the 60s and 70s. To nah, we'll just make it a, a rough cut. Let's just do it. We're going to talk NBA right Thanks, now. Larry. San Antonio <laughs> will play at Sacramento tonight. They got a rebound from that Portland loss, but it's another learning experience for the Spurs. And Steph dropped 50 last night, but it didn't matter. Coming up. The Spurs will continue their five-game road trip around the West Coast tonight at Sacramento Kings. The Spurs dropped the first two games at Golden State and then in Portland the fall to 6-9 and nine this season. Tuesday night center Jakob Pertl had a career night with 31 points to go with 14 rebounds. He's pretty much a double-double machine. He said that 117-110 to loss at Portland was a tough swallow, but the season, well, it just goes on. I mean, yeah, like that's that's the, the learning experience um, for us, and and yeah, it, it hurts every single time um, when we feel like we have games in our hand or um, yeah, we have a, a good run going. We we feel like we have it all figured out, and then we we throw it away with uh, little things, um, execution mistakes. Uh, yeah, um, just like I said, a lot to learn from. Kings and Spurs will play tonight at 9 local time from the Golden One Center in Sacramento. Now, Golden State guard Steph Curry dropped 50 points last night on the Phoenix Suns, but it still wasn't enough to help them win the game. All five Phoenix starters scored double digits, and they outshot the Dubs from 3, 21 to 18, added all up, and the Suns take it 130 to 119, dropping the champs to 6 and 9 on the season. In men's college basketball, number 11, Texas was favored to beat number two, Gonzaga, in Austin, and that's what they did. Horns guard Tyrese Hunter led the offensive charge with 26 points. Last season's Big 12 freshman of the year was 9 of 14 overall, and he made five of Texas' 13 to three-pointers. UT shot 13 to 33 from distance, and for the game, they made 34 of 66 shots for 51.5% from the floor. Texas rolls number two, Gonzaga, about a final of 93 to 74 to improve to 3-0 on the young season. 
Yeah, obviously we said before the game that it would take our best 40 minutes to this point in our early season to play and beat Gonzaga at home. And that's what we did. That was our best 40. I don't think it's anywhere near the 40 that we can play as the year goes on. Uh, but I want to recognize our players' effort, preparation. Um, and it's a big win because a lot of the reason we – so much respect for Gonzaga, right? So um, – we have a lot of respect for their program, their coach, their consistency, their players. So, yeah, we recognize this is a great win for our team because, among other things, Gonzaga is really good. Texas will next play Northern Arizona and Edinburgh on Monday the 21st. Number three, Houston was home facing Texas Southern last night. First half, Marcus Sasser goes to the rim for the hoop and the foul. He led Houston with 20 points. Jarris Walker was next for the Cougs at 19, and Houston wins 83-48, improving to 4-0 the season and 3-0 at home. After drafting two quarterbacks, Jawan Pass and Anthony Russo as the first pick to the San Antonio Brahmas of the XFL, head coach Heinz Ward announced they have also added Reed Sennett, who was released by the Dolphins. Now, yesterday, the draft continued, and the Brahmas added running back Jacquez Patrick with the third pick in the first round. He's played in the NFL with the Bengals and the 49ers, just to name two. Ooh, see, so they got some uh, ex-NFL guys. Yeah. So that means the talent level ought to be pretty Bump, much. Bumping up a little bit, yeah. for sure. The excitement yep. is building. Yep. I'm excited. Thanks, like Larry. That. Coming up, the FDA now says lab-grown chicken is okay to eat. How the poultry is created. A promising new Alzheimer's drug not performing the way research it had hoped. A look at the latest clinical trials after the break.